Richard Glazier, hello. Nice to be here, thank you. So this all started for you with the movies, movie musicals, even as a kid. Yeah, I, I saw Girl Crazy for the first time when I was nine years old, and I just fell in love with the voice of Judy Garland and the music of George and Ira Gershwin. I loved those big band arrangements of Tommy Dorsey, uh, especially hearing things like Fascinate and Rhythm in the film, and I Got Rhythm, and hearing Judy so poignantly sing, but not for me in that film. Even as a young kid, movie musicals? Even as a young kid, and you know, I've tried to analyze why, why did that touch me so deeply when I was a kid, and I really can't put my finger on it, I can't find the answer. Uh, it's just one of those kind of mysteries of life that just started, and, and frankly, I try not to analyze it too much. But what exactly was it that grabbed you? I think uh, it evoked a time and a, and, and a romance and a warmth, uh, a simpler time maybe, uh, where the, the world was a lot more mysterious, it wasn't as small as, as it is today, um, where people weren't in such a hurry as they are now, and had a time to really reflect and think and, 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 and really achieve the excellence. That was the thing, these movies, these movies were on such a high level, such creative geniuses went into making these films that, uh, I don't know, I, I, I thought about those kinds of things when I was a kid. And I loved, I loved old things. Mm -hmm. I loved old records, I loved old books, I loved going to the library. I wish it'd be the Library of Congress, but I was from Indiana, so I couldn't go there. Uh, but I, I loved going into the stacks and seeing the old books and the old sheet music. Mm -hmm. And then you had the chance to meet Ira Gershwin when you were 12, and it sounds like that was a life-changing event. Indeed it was. Uh, because of my aunt and my passion for the Gershwins that started when I was nine years old when I saw Girl Crazy, uh, I had to find out everything I could about the Gershwin brothers and we went back to the library and I checked out books, records and sheet music and we used to go to the Goodwill and the Salvation Army where I have 78 records still in my collection today of uh, Gershwin by Andre Castellanos or Oscar Levant or Eddie Duchin or Carmen Cavallero. And my aunt decided on one Saturday afternoon that we should write a fan letter to Ira. But what is a nine-year-old kid going to say to Ira Gershwin? And we wrote, Dear Mr. Gershwin, may I please have a picture of George to hang in my room? Where are we going to mail the letter? We don't know where Ira Gershwin lives. We're from Indianapolis, Indiana. Well, my aunt suggests that we mail the letter in care of the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. I think one Lincoln Plaza, New York, New York, something like that and asked them to forward the letter. Four months later, an eight and a half by 11 manila envelope arrives in the mail. Gershwin commemorative stamps in the right hand corner, upper right hand corner, issued by the post office in the year of 1973. In the upper left hand corner it said Gershwin, 1021 North Roxbury Drive, Beverly Hills, California 90210. We opened the envelope and inside was an eight by 10 glossy of Ira's beloved brother George, and what Ira had done was to clip an original signature of his brother's from a canceled check from the early 1930s. From this, we developed a correspondence that lasted for three years, which culminated on April 2nd, 1975, when I was 12 years old, when Ira invited me to come to 1021 North Roxbury to visit him. What was that like, though? I mean, he was an older man. And very reclusive, mm -hmm. uh, and didn't go out much at the time, and I had no idea about this until many years later uh, when the family told me what an ordeal it was really for Ira to open the house, uh, which he affectionately called the plantation, by the way. Uh, and so it's amazing. I mean, that's the other thing. The composers and the people that lived in Beverly Hills during that time, it was like, it was like a giant family. It was like a wonderful family. Everybody was in it together. I mean, uh, Ira lived next door to Rosemary Clooney on one side, and Agnes Moorhead lived on the other side. And Lucille Ball lived across the street, and Oscar Levant lived one block down with Jimmy Stewart. And it, it was just, it was, it was a family, it really was. And when we went into the home, we were greeted by uh, the self-portrait of George, which is hanging here in the Gershwin room at the Library of Congress, which when uh, Ira passed away, uh, donated so much of the archive to the Library of Congress and, and of course has become uh, a major beneficiary of the Gershwin estate. Uh, and so I got to see that, that self-portrait as I was sitting across a circular table 
from Ira. And at this circular table, every Saturday night in 1949, Ira played cards with Vincent Minnelli, Gene Kelly, and Arthur Freed. And it was over that table where the 1951 Academy Award winning film An American in Paris was born. When you were with Ira, you, you played for him. What was that like? He asked me to go over and play the piano, which is right behind me right now, which is just unbelievable. I mean, it's been 30, like 35 years, something like that. And this is the piano where they composed, they can't take that away from me, A Foggy Day, Love Walked In, Shall We Dance, uh, Nice Work If You Can Get It, Let's Call the Whole Thing Off, Love Is Here to Stay, not to mention Porgy and Bess. And I knew that when I went over to the piano when he asked me to play. And this is the piano that Harold Arlen played, the piano that Oscar Levant played, where Judy Garland would come over and sing when Arlen might accompany her in The Man That Got Away, which Ira wrote the lyric to, for A Star Is Born. Uh, there's so much wonderful history and wonderful energy behind this Steinway D that belonged to George. That uh, Certainly, if if, ta if talent could rub off from the piano, anybody who played it would become a genius. Mm -hmm. uh, it, has, it has such wonderful energy. Uh, so Ira asked me to play the piano. I sat down and played Embraceable You. And Ira sang the lyric as I, as I played the song. In his uh, not very good voice, but very, very charming New York accent. Uh, Ira, you have to understand, was a very quiet individual. He was very, you know, you would be in the presence of one of the greatest lyricists in, in American arts and letters and not have a clue that you were with such a brilliant man because he was so unassuming and humble and just very warm. Uh, George was really the antithesis of that. He was the life of the party. Uh, and, and Ira just absolutely worshipped the ground that his brother walked on. So you can imagine the dynamic that occurred on this horrible day of July 11th, 1937, when George died of what we call a glioblastoma multiforme of the left temporal lobe, which is a malignant brain tumor. And nobody had any idea that's what he was suffering from. And Ira really never obviously fully recovered from that tragedy. But when we talk about George Gershwin, we cannot ever forget about the genius of this quiet, wonderful man who was so highly educated and so he adored the music of Gilbert and Sullivan. He loved the theater and this all reflects in his lyrics as a master of rhyme, alliteration, metaphor, simile. Explain this for people who don't know. What, how, did, how did the Gershwins change the world or change the world musically? Uh, the Gershwins are really the voice of America, what we represent in the best sense of the word. They represent what America is. And of course, it's that melting pot of the many cultures that came to this country to come to the land paved with golden opportunity, to make a better life for their children and their families. But how, how does music do that? And George, growing up on the Lower East Side of New York, heard the voices of James Reese Europe, the black, great black American uh, composer and band leader, he heard jazz, he heard Yiddish theater, he heard classical music, he heard opera, all of the many voices of the melting pot of what makes this country great. He mixed it all together in a giant pot to create his own unique American voice. And what better represents that than something like the Rhapsody in Blue? It is a piece as Americans that we can take such great pride in because it is so purely and uniquely American and represents us in our best light. And it is the voice of New York, it's the voice of America, the voice of our people, the voice of a genius, um, doing something that nobody had ever done before. And not only could he do that, but he was a great songwriter. And he wrote these great songs that, you know, I've played to hundreds of thousands of people across the world. To the older generation, these great songs of George and Ira Gershwin, evoke memories, evoke places, evoke times, evoke feelings. To the younger generation, they're discovering something completely new and music and songs that are immortal and timeless that will live for generations to come. 
So it's both of these things kind of coming together that makes this music so incredibly unique and special and that we can take tremendous pride in as Americans throughout the world. Great songwriters, of course, also need great interpreters. So what, what do the great ones bring to a song? They bring, uh, there's that X factor that's always in a performance. This, you really can't put your finger on it, but it, it, there's this, this, this greatness, this God-given talent that when they, when they communicate what they're feeling, that we feel something very deep in our soul when we're listening to them on screen or in a concert hall or on a recording, that, that we're moved, that, that they have touched something in us that makes us more than just a bag of chemicals uh, having chemical reactions, that we have, there's a soul that's being touched in there. And when Judy sings, but not for me, uh, that is a perfect example of that. And, or when Ella Fitzgerald sings the songbook, or when Oscar Levant played the concerto in F with Andre Castellanets. Um, there's, there's this feeling that we get. And, and also this wonderful link also to, to the composers and, this res and also a, a deep respect that is paid to the genius of these men. You know, Ira was not so crazy about the way that Sarah Vaughan sang his songs oh, really? because she took liberties with the lyric. No. Uh, she would change indefinite articles, uh, you know, pronouns. And Ira, he, didn't like he, his he, slaved, he slaved over his lyrics. No. I mean, it's not coincidental or happen chance that he rhymed salmon with backgammon in one of his songs. It's all very carefully thought out. He slaved over his lyric. As his lyric sheets show, uh, as, uh, here on deposit at the Library of Congress, so many of them, you can see uh, when the researchers come or the public wants to come to see uh, some of the resources of the Gershwin uh, family here at the Library of Congress, they can see for themselves the painstaking process that Ira went through to write his lyrics. And you've said, I try to interpret the lyric as she, Judy Garland would, but with my fingers. Now, what does that mean? I, you know, although I love to, you know, I, I have w worked with singers in the past and done a lot of that. My main focus is doing a one-man show. And I play these songs and try to interpret them as the way some of these great singers that I've grown up with would sing those phrases. That's how I try to interpret the music and communicate it with. Uh, my friend Hugh Martin, who was, uh, who the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian Institution are involved with, who wrote Meet Me in St. Louis for Judy Garland, which is have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, the trolley song, The Boy Next Door, who grew up worshiping Rhapsody in Blue and the music of the Gershwins, has told me, you know, you need to play these concerts by yourself because you sing the lyric through your fingers. You don't need to have somebody sing with you. The lyric is there when you play the phrases, the feeling, in other words. You sing the music through your fingers. fingers. That's correct. That, I, think that, I think that says it right there. And I've worked very, very hard to, to try to achieve that through study, through listening, through, of course, the love of, of what I feel. And um, hopefully I'm able to communicate a love and a spirit of what I feel to my audiences across the country, which is really the greatest privilege as a performer that I can have is to be able to share this love because this music is to be shared with everyone. Uh, to inspire, to, it's really a gift that they gave us that as a performer, I want to give back to people and communicate the love and passion that I feel to audiences, to get them excited, to, to make them happy, to, to evoke, it's another wonderful thing, these songs, you know, a person might think, well, you know, my mother and father courted each other to Love is here to stay. Maybe it was their first dance. My mother and father used to listen to this on the radio. I used to listen to Rhapsody in Blue when I was a kid when my mom put the Levant recording on the record. And so it'll evoke a memory from a younger person of that and they'll think about their loved one maybe who is deceased and think about them in a good way, with happy memories, with good feelings, and not be sad. And are you afraid that all this is being lost? A younger generation of people that just don't know much about the music or the times? 
I go into schools and I try so hard to, to communicate, but it's, it's a symptom of a larger problem, which is a whole other discussion of, and yes, I am afraid, but we do everything that we can as individuals to try to make a difference. You know, maybe if there's a field trip of kids from Maryland or Virginia and around the Library of Congress and they come, and maybe there's a 10-year-old child that has come on a field trip to the Library of Congress and had the pleasure and honor of coming into the Gershwin Room as part of that field trip and looked at all of these wonderful, priceless treasures of America, and maybe he'll be, that one child, will something will strike a chord, if you will, in them and make something happen. Well, then it's worth it. Richard Glazier, thanks for talking to us. Thank you.